Hello, and welcome to the State Museum of Egyptian Art in Munich. I'm Sonia Fokka, and this is the newest installment in our series of about holy places in ancient Egypt. Today, we will be learning about the private tombs of the Old Kingdom. Unfortunately, due to health concerns, I can't be with you live, but hopefully, even digitally, we can learn a lot about the private tombs of the Old Kingdom. Starting with, when is the Old Kingdom? The Old Kingdom is pretty much at the start of Egyptian history. It's the time where we're pretty certain that Egypt in its entirety as we know it was one country. Um, and it starts with the Third Dynasty and encompasses the Fourth, Fifth and Sixth. And I'm sure you can recognize some of the names in here, such as Cheops, Kefren and Mykerinos. Meanwhile, all these kings were building pyramids, monumental tombs of stone. And this goes on throughout the whole of the Old Kingdom. And adjacent to these pyramids were private cemeteries. These were mostly the high officials associated with the king um, who wanted to be buried near him, either to continue to serve him in the afterlife or simply to continue to be associated with him for all eternity. The main cemeteries, therefore, are grouped near the capital of Memphis. Uh, in the third dynasty, this is Saqqara. In the fourth, we have Dashur, Medum, and Giza. And in the fifth and sixth, we have Abu Gurash, Abu Sir, and the rest of Saqqara. And as you can see, they're all more or less grouped together near the ancient capital of Memphis. These are high limestone plateaus um, in the desert, so far from the cultivation and um, rather far from the Nile, although you need to remember that during the period of ancient Egypt, the inundation would reach as far as the Giza Plateau. There are two main tomb types for private individuals. One of them is the Mastaba tomb and the other is the Raqqa tombs. And throughout Egyptian history, we have two main elements to an ancient Egyptian tomb. That is the offering area and the burial area. The burial area will be underground, either in a, at the bottom of a shaft or of a sloping passage with one or more burial chambers cut into the rock. And the offering place varies. In the Mastabas, it is a built-up tumulus with various areas for offering that vary throughout time. We'll be seeing how. And in the rock-cut tombs, this area is cut horizontally into a cliff face and may include some elements on a terrace before it, um, with the burial shafts then leading from there. So in the burial chamber, this is where the mummy comes. This is where all the furniture and food that they are taking with them physically comes. And they are generally blocked in some way through rubble or through some kind of blocking stone. Nobody goes into the burial chamber once the burial is over. The offering place is where the life of the tomb is. Um, and this is associated with the way the ancient Egyptians viewed the afterlife. The afterlife was basically a mirror of this life, which means that you still had to eat, you still had to drink, you still needed furniture and clothes and everything else, and you might also want to enjoy the same pastimes. So the decoration of the offering place will reflect that, in addition for providing space for actual physical offerings that would come at regular intervals brought by members of your family or by priests that are being paid to do so. So this area is where most of the decoration takes place. And in fact, for most of the Old Kingdom, the only place where there is any decoration. The main and most important part, that's practically a part of the architecture, is the offering table scene. And this starts as early as before the Old Kingdom in the Second Dynasty, 
where simple markers for private tombs with the name of the deceased are replaced by a whole scene, showing the deceased in front of a heaped offering table with food and drink and sometimes a few additional items. This is expanded over the course of the Old Kingdom, um, so-called offering lists, so that, as you can see in the slap stila of Nefer appear, so that you not only have the picture here of uh, these are flatbreads put on their side. Uh, so you don't only have the picture of the food, but also an enumeration of the various things that, um, that the deceased should have or should be equipped with for the afterlife. And this goes on until the end of the new kingdom, uh, the end of the old kingdom, and the offering table scene is to be found throughout Egyptian history as one of the main imagery of the tomb. What appears in the Old Kingdom is something called a false door stela. And it originates as part of the architecture of the tomb in the sense of a series of recessed niches along the outside of the tomb. Um, it is thought to imitate the walls of a city or possibly the posts of a house with various entrances. And this is slowly reduced to door elements and a room. The door elements are at the bottom. This is a wonderful piece you can see in our museum belonging to a priestess of Hathor named Humid. And here we see the various areas. So we see the door with its, very often you'll see the two door jams, possibly also um, a latch to close it. Then what is here called the inner jam is basically the inner part of the jam, the thickness of the wall. The outer jam is what you would see in a door as you go towards it. You have the roll, which is generally interpreted as a rolled up mat that could cover the door. And then over it, you have the offering scene. It can be interpreted as a window to look inside. However, windows in ancient Egyptian homes were generally very small and high placed. Um, most likely, this is simply the ancient Egyptian way of showing a house. You have, um, you see that on many uh, depictions in tombs, especially later on, where you would have a house and you would see the door from the front, but it would be sort of, yeah, clapped up so that you can see the whole door. It's not just a little hole, but you'd see the whole door. So everybody knows it's a door. And then you would see the rooms as a square to show the space it was taking. And then whatever the person was doing in the room is shown in a semi-profile, the typical Egyptian sort of twisted profile um, look. So basically this is showing a house for eternity in which the deceased can live and in which it can receive offerings. Um, additionally, this served as a kind of door for the soul to reach the tomb through the afterlife. And very often the statue, which was one of the focus points for the offering rituals, um, would be found either behind or near the false door stela. And um, any offering basins or offering tables would have been placed before so that the offerings were directly in front of the door. Statues were equally important, but it's important to note that they were not there to tell you or show you what the person looked like. They were not there to celebrate their deeds. The statues were there to provide a body for the soul when they come to pick up their offerings which is why it was not particularly important that they be visible. In fact, most of them throughout the Old Kingdom were in a walled up room called the Sardab, an Arabic word meaning cellar. And you can see a Sardab here as it was found in Abydos, um, still with its statues inside. You can see that it was walled up. Um, and you can see that the statues were not always of stone. They could also be of wood. And in the Old Kingdom, very seldom or not at all for private people, but later on, very occasionally of metal as well. We have some very, very 
beautiful wooden examples from the Old Kingdom. And the fellow on the right is also somebody you can meet in our museum. He's a flute player named E.P. Um, however, this walled off um, room does not appear to have been strictly necessary. Um, either it was done to protect the statues, some of them were quite small and easily portable, or from, to prevent them from being knocked over, possibly. But in rock-cut tombs especially, and in certain later Mastaba tombs in the burial chamber area, statues could be carved directly into the walls. And that's where you see the more you have, the better it is. So that um, over time, both these pre-standing statues, but also the statues in the rock cut tombs um, became more and more numerous. And here you can see two examples. We'll be getting back to um, the decoration of rock cut tombs, etc. cetera. Um, so the tomb owner would have a statue and very often there would be statues of his family members. And again, this is most common in the rock cut tombs where you were decorating the walls anyway, you were carving them anyway, you might as well uh, carve some three almost three-dimensional images of the deceased, whereas the freestanding statues, you would need to get a block of stone. Um, and these were generally gifts from the king or somehow acquired from um, the royal workshops. A very interesting thing is during part of Fourth Dynasty, they didn't have statues at all, at least not in the mastabas of the Western Cemetery. They just had heads. And nobody is quite sure why these heads were not in the upper cult area, like statues usually were. They were in the burial area at the bottom of the shaft or in the, um, or in the burial chamber itself. And they are just heads without a body. This is something that is very rare in ancient Egyptian sculpture. Um, however, they do fulfill the main element of a statue. It's something that can, has a mouth and nose that can breathe. So it's something that the soul can inhabit. And having a mouth, it can also eat and consume offerings. Why it was in the burial chamber is unclear. Um, we will see that in that time there were very little space for the cult area. So there seems to have not been any space for the statue. Perhaps it was considered to be in, in safer in the burial chamber. There are various other theories that it would have been placed on the little mound to simulate the sun god rising from the primeval mound or from the lotus flower, which is a symbolism that you find, but later on in Egyptian history, and especially this close association for the de of the deceased with the sun god was at that time something that was reserved for the king. So it seems not very likely that this is something that a private person um, would be associated with. Mummification at the time, um, we do have some very excellent examples of mummification that have survived from Lunera Compolis and Saqqara, but we also have examples that show that um, they were still experimenting at the time, um, which can include just bones that were basically a skeleton that was molded with linen to look alive and various other stages. Um, so it may be that they were not completely confident with their mummification and wanted some sort of um, yeah, reserve, these are called reserve heads in Egyptology, um, close to the body just in case the soul couldn't find the mummy. As it is, we don't know. Unfortunately, they did not leave us a little pamphlet saying why we decided to make reserve heads. So what kind of depictions, what kind of imagery can you expect from a tomb in the Old Kingdom? The main one is depictions of the deceased. Apart from the offering table scene, you might have, table, uh, have scenes of him sitting or standing. He usually has uh, a long staff in his hand to show how important he is. 
Um, here we can see an example from the third dynasty and then later on from our museum, from our collection, something from the sixth dynasty. And we see that it's all there. It's to show how important it is. He has the staff. Um, on the right, he has a little beard, which was also a sign of a high official. On the left, he has um, a scribal palette um, to show he could read and write. So basically accentuating their importance. Um, we did say we need to eat and drink in the afterlife. This means physical offerings, but it also means that you need to make sure that if the physical offerings are not there or fail for some reason, you have a backup. That's what the offering table scenes are for. But in those chapels that have more space, they will also include scenes of fruit production to make sure that the offering table is always well provisioned. Um, here we have a scene of butchery from, again, from our collection, and one of catching fowl from the tomb of Meruruka. Um, agricultural scenes. So you can have bread and beer, obviously also the production of bread and beer, which were the food staples of ancient Egypt. Many um, of the more important and in those tombs where there was space for it, uh, also like to show what they did in life. So if they were somebody who supervised um, workshops, they would have scenes of workshops. Um, if they owned a lot of cattle, they might have scenes of them inspecting cattle. Um, this also had a double use since here we have, for example, some um, carpentry workshops. Um, they would be making things for the tomb and they would be shown making things for the tomb and for and various pieces of furniture, which then of course could serve to provision the deceased in the afterlife. But we also have simple scenes of scribes writing it down, which you might think might not be that important in the afterlife, but it was part of daily life that they wanted to take with them. Then there are some scenes that are more symbolic in nature, such as the hunt in the marshes. This can take several different aspects. We see on the left, T is not doing the hunting himself. He has people spearing the hippopotamus for him. Um, whereas on the right, we have a scene that is much more common and remains common into the New Kingdom. That's the time starting um, 1500 BC of the deceased shown twice on a thin papyrus skiff. In one, he's catching birds, and in the other, he's catching two different fish that have a solar connotation. So this is something that has to do with rebirth, with the cycle of life and death. And um, the same can be said of the marsh itself, which is one of the first things to have come into being uh, at the creation of the world. Um, at the same time, in catching, in hunting dangerous animals such as hippopotami and crocodiles on the left, or just chaotic animals such as birds and fish, you are helping to keep away the chaos that is trying to encroach upon the world and make sure that the balance, the order of the world is kept upright. Um, you are doing your part in making sure that the creation cycle could continue. And this is something that is very present in royal imagery and a little bit in private imagery in such scenes, such as hunting scenes that are both a means of getting meat for the afterlife, the sport, but also a way of um, all this wildlife. If they're sort of in a limital area, um, they are part of the world, but they are also not as orderly as human society. And so um, to hunt and to capture wildlife was a way to make sure that the order of the world would continue to exist. Then there are some purely religious scenes. You don't see any scenes of gods in the Old Kingdom private tombs, but this is something adjacent. This shows a pilgrimage to the holy city of Abydos, where the oldest kings, the kings from the first and second dynasties were buried and where 
the tomb of Osiris was thought to reside. And this was south of Egypt, and this remains important when we consider um, the way the offering places are set up. So now we have an idea of the sort of pictures you would find inside these tombs. And let's have a bit of a look at the architecture. It's very easy to see Egypt as one monolith, but even within one period, there was development, there were fashion, and there was growth. And that is true of the mastabas. Mastaba, by the way, is also an Arabic term, and it means bench. The mastabas are always rectangular, very occasionally square. They are longer than they are tall. And the burial is usually accessed by a direct vertical shaft, very occasionally by a sloping passage that slopes gently down. In the Third Dynasty, we are still building out of mud brick. Um, the facades are generally paneled with niches. We can't see that here that much, but what's interesting is that they are tend to be very, very big. Um, this is something that they took over from the previous periods where very high officials and queens would have these immense mastabas. And this continues at least at the beginning of the Third Dynasty. This is one from Beit Halaf. I've been there. They are enormous. Um, or here, a very well-known one from the reign of Djoser in Saqqara, the mastaba of Hezire. And um, what you can see here is how the offering area is set up. And what's interesting is they had a long corridor that was paneled again to have these sort of false door um, idea, but with, without an actual false door stila. Instead, what was in the middle of each of these recesses was a wooden depiction, a wooden panel with a relief of Hezire. Now this was later walled in. As the mastaba was expanded, you can see to the bottom how it was expanded, a more simple corridor was built with two main offering areas. It goes from north to south. The offering areas are oriented towards the west. And what's interesting is that the southern one then received a much bigger series of rooms. Um, and this is something that you will see throughout the Old Kingdom, that there are generally at least two offering places, and the southern one is the one that is more elaborate. Um, this may be, have to do with the fact that the inundation comes from the south, that the sun stays in the southern part of the sky. Um, these are both imagery that has to do with resurrection, but also the fact that Abydos is in the south, and you will be seeing a mastaba in Abydos that has a quite different setup. The good thing about this expansion is that it completely bricked in the wood paneling, which means that it has survived up until now. Here we see a slightly simpler version, or rather a different variation of this. This is a fairly big and elaborate mastaba in Saqqara, also dating to Djoser, and that therefore is often attributed to his architect Imhotep. We see we also have in the south a series of rooms. We have two offering places in a sort of cruciform shape that we will find again throughout the Old Kingdom with a long corridor leading to a perpendicular long room, and then a niche for either a false door stila, a statue, depending on the time. And then here we have a series of rooms again in the south, the southern area is the more important one. An interesting thing about the mastabas of the Old Kingdom is that the shaft leading to the burial chamber generally has stairs. This stops after the Third Dynasty. After that, anything that needs to go down this shaft, including the people to set up the coffins, are lowered by ropes, and at least the people are then raised back up using ropes. 
In the fourth dynasty, we are now under the reign of Smefru. We see the first stone mastabas, usually with a rubble core. We can see that the paneling on the exterior remains, usually only along one side. So in the time before the, new, the Old Kingdom, the paneling would have been around the whole of the mastaba, whereas starting the Third Dynasty and the beginning of the Fourth, it's on the eastern side only. Um, here in Meijun, we see again two offering places. However, we don't have this long corridor within the core of the tumulus itself. Instead, the offering places are set into the facade. And again, the southern one gets a little extra chapel. Um, the southern one is generally that of the person who owns the mastaba, uh, the man. If the wife has her own offering place, it will be the northern one. Generally also, they will each have their own shaft and burial chamber with the man's being slightly bigger and it will have a small recess for, we think, a canopic chest. This tomb is particularly interesting because, for one thing, the burial chamber has this corbelled roof, which you see in the royal burial chambers of the time, and they experimented with a way to color their depictions. So instead of having a relief that they painted, they hollowed out all the depictions and put colored paste in. And it's unfortunately, the binding element did not keep and most of it has fallen out. But what has remained is truly breathtaking. And we also have some pieces in our museum. Please come visit. Um, perhaps of interest is also that they did not do this throughout the whole of the offering places. Part of the offering place of Etet, of the wife, was simply painted, which is also very rare in the Old Kingdom. They tended to carve reliefs into stone panels that were set either into the rubble when it's within the tumulus or into the masonry, and then paint that. Whereas this is strictly painted, and this is the scene that the famous Meiju geese come from. Again, here in Meiju, early fourth dynasty, also the site of a very famous find. We see the two offering places. Here, however, they were then walled up and statues placed inside. So these are the first true known sardabs, these walled up places for the tomb statues. And here, because they remained walled up, they also retained all of their paint. Imagine anything that I show you and any statue that you see in an Egyptian museum looked like that. Was that vibrantly painted? So by expanding their mastabas, they basically created their sardabs and then added a little offering chapel in front. Now we come to the most famous of the cemeteries which is that of Giza, most famous because it has the three best known pyramids, including the largest, that of Cheops. And Cheops is the one who also founded the cemetery, this whole necropolis. He was the first to build his pyramid there, he was also the biggest, but he also did some urban planning when it came to the tombs of his officials. Instead of simply having, giving them the right to build their tombs somewhere uh, in the vicinity of his pyramid, he actually planned out two cemeteries. Uh, one was to the west. The western cemetery was for less, less important family members and for high officials. And the ones to the east were for the immediate family. They're adjacent to the three satellite pyramids for his queens. What's interesting is that um, they were not planned with much of an offering area. The core mastabas were, apart from a few that were entirely out of stone, were mostly rubble faced with stone. They had a burial 
a simple burial shaft, and they had a very simple chapel on the south, on the southern end of the east side. This is already one that was expanded. This happened as early as the reign of Cheops himself, as people decided they wanted to add to the basic, the basic model. So they pimped their mastabas in various ways. Here they added two offering niches. And the little chapel, which would have been of mud brick, was replaced by stone. What's interesting is these did not all, any of them originally have a false door stila. They just had, as the only decoration in their original forms, a small slab stila, it's called, it's just a rectangular one, with a picture of the offering table. We'll be seeing one soon. But of course, various people expanded it in various ways. You could expand by expanding the chapel area. Um, this is actually after um, after Cheops and under his successor, Jedefrey, but it was done by various mastabas under his reign as well, where you can see that the simple offering chapel is expanded somewhat. And one good clue that this is a later mastaba is that it has Sir Dobbs with statues that were found inside. This is also a very famous one of Seneb and his wife, which was found in the Northern Chapel. Another way would have been to take the core mastaba, mastaba and expand it in its length, and then use that expansion to build rooms within the tumulus, within the core of the mastaba itself. This is something that Kani Misut did. He also took the opportunity to add a serdab. His chapel you can see in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Wien. Another way to expand would be to expand the width, so built in front usually the eastern side where the chapel was, so that you could have the chapel rooms inside the core of the mastaba. And this is what the princess Nefret Yavet did, uh, whose statue is here in our museum. Interestingly enough, we don't know exactly where the statue would have stood because her original mastaba just had two slab stila. This is hers. A very beautiful piece now in the Louvre, and one for her husband, Upanofret. It is her mastaba, however, because hers is the southern offering area. So she was the main person to use this mastaba. Um, but there is no space. There's no serdab, um, and there's no space that was would have been clearly designated as a space for a statue within the offering place. Of course, it is not in very good condition. You can see it below what it looks like now. Um, but yeah, the two slab stila were then built over basically by this expansion, which is also a reason why they kept their color. A similar thing happened with Hemunu. What's interesting here is that he decided to go old school and have a very long corridor within the body of his tumulus connecting the two offering areas and then have a little chapel area added in front as well. And you know it is best known for being the overseer of the works for the Great Pyramid. And his statue, the one found in the Northern Mastaba, is now in Hildesheim, where you can visit it and say hi. The Eastern Cemetery is interesting for a completely different reason. Um, this was the immediate family, so they got bigger mastabas to start with, um, 12. And then at some point they decided to, because each mastaba originally only had one shaft, but they wanted some with two. I guess people wanted to have their families with them for the afterlife. And so they linked, in the two northernmost rows, they linked these two huge mastabas together to make an even bigger one. And then the other mastabas were also somewhat expanded so that they could have a second shaft. Um, 
but these led to some rather monumental ones. And again, you took the opportunity to add some rooms for the chapel within the body of the mastaba itself. Especially, especially cool. At Gizeh, we not only have the private tombs of the very important people and high officials that would have been in the king's court, we have some very humble people as well, namely those who built the pyramids themselves. The workers' village was found um, not too far, but you can see here the Giza Plateau, and um, not too far, this would have been near the canal that would have um, that would have linked the pyramids to the Nile. They had bakeries, they had dormitories, they had houses, um, and they had their tombs. The necropolis of the tomb builders is divided into two. In the lower part, you have the mid-level overseers and the people who actually built the tombs. In tombs that are either little miniature mastabas sometimes even with a little chapel in front of it. They might occasionally have a very simple and crude false door stela. And the workers would have these hive-like domed tombs. These would be over a simple pit. The workers did not have any coffins. They, would have, they were all buried in a fetal position with a few offerings whereas the mid-level overseers may occasionally have had, um, if they could afford it, a coffin. They had a small shaft to a small burial chamber. And then there are the higher level of overseers. These are people with titles like director of works, director of draftsmen, um, overseer of the side of the pyramid, inspector of craftsmen, overseer of masonry, and they had larger, not quite as large as the Boi Poloi up near the pyramids, but slightly larger mastaba-like tombs, a better form of false door stela. They do not have any other decoration. The false door stela is the only decorated area but what they did is add some images to the false door stela. Like here, this man added scenes of brewing beer and making bread. Um, it is suggested that this may have something to do with what they did, because we don't have his titles, this man named Nefer Paif. Um, but it is also possible that this was, just like in the bigger tombs, a way of provisioning him for the afterlife. And also some of the more important people, such as this priest, of the goddess knife, he was in charge of her boat, which would have gone out in procession. Um, he could afford some statues of himself as well. So this is a very exciting thing and a view into the tombs of the not so rich, which is rather rare. In the provinces, it is less likely to find big tombs. We do have some rock cut tombs from the starting about the time of Kefren. Um, but we do occasionally have mastaba tombs outside of the big necropolises of Memphis. For example, um, in El Tarif, in Thebes, or um, El Kab, for example. Meanwhile, after Cheops, there is more of a tendency to have the chapel area within the body of the tumulus. Um, you keep the two offering areas. The chapel might be um, only in the south, but you'll have a smaller offering area within the facade of the mastaba than in the north. And that's how the beginning of the fifth dynasty starts as well. But starting about the middle, things start getting a bit more elaborate. For one thing, you don't have this, the orientation changes slightly. So you don't have anything parallel really to the Eastern facade. Instead, the rooms are directly oriented east-west. And instead of having the false door stila in the wall, of, in the west wall, 
of a long corridor, you have it in the west wall, but at the end of the corridor, as you can see here in the tomb of Perneb from Saqqara. Um, one thing that also appears in the latter half of the fifth dynasty is courtyards. Here we have Perneb. Perneb is not a particularly um, elaborate tomb, but he has a court courtyard that then leads upwards, you can see, through a vestibule and then to the long corridor where the false door stela is. So it gives a kind of L shaped that is typical for the fifth dynasty. We have the sardas all on the left and we have the two vertical shafts. But one thing that appears also at the end of the fifth dynasty is monumental mastabas again. Only these have a plethora of rooms and a lot of things that are taken from royal architecture. So until now, private architecture was more or less doing its own thing, with a few exceptions. But now, all of a sudden, we're taking elements from the royal funerary complexes and integrating them into private architecture. Tashet says, as far as we know, is the first one to have done this in Abu Sir. And it starts with something quite mundane, which is staircases to the top of the mastaba. Um, this is very common in funerary temples where you can go to the roof of the temple. This was for various cultic reasons. Um, also interesting, there were also a staircase to a kind of second story that had a niche with a few statues. Now, as you can see, it started out with the sort of L-shaped thing. You have two long corridors with two um, with two false door stela, north and south again. Again, the south one is a little bit bigger. And then you start ex he started expanding. And instead of building in front, he expanded the whole of the tumulus and added these rooms inside as he was building. And one thing he added was a chapel, that's number three, with three statue niches, which is, these are open statue niches parallel to each other. So not a sardab. And these are reminiscent of the five statue niches that you find in the royal complexes at the time. Then in the offering room with the false door stela, there is a kind of low bench added on the low side. There's a kind of low bench added on the north side. This is also an element that was taken from the royal complexes. It gets a portico with some very nice columns in front. Um, and then as it expands, it gets a wide open court, not necessarily that big, but as we saw with Parnet, this is a feature that is also taken over for the smaller tombs. A series of magazines, which is also something um, that you find in the royal funerary complexes. It was a place to store cultic objects. And a very big room, which um, due to later tombs in the sixth dynasty, we think may have held boats. We'll be coming to those. And to top it all off, in the burial chamber itself, it had a pointed gable roof, just like, again, the royal burial chambers within the pyramid, in this case, Sahore. Now, in the sixth dynasty, basically, what we saw with Perneb continues, except there tends to be a few more rooms. They tend to try to use up the space within the tumulus. Towards the end of the sixth dynasty, after that, they start at having less rooms. But again, you have some truly monumental mastabas that really go all the way. We have Meruhuka, who has 30 rooms, including separate little suites for his wife and son. Um, you can see his mastaba here in the picture. That's his full store. And you can see what I was talking about earlier, the offering place in front of the full store stila. Those become bigger and more elaborate as well. And that little bench on the north side. Now, Kagemni, for example, does not have as many rooms, but he does have two rooms in boat shape where we suspect that boats may have 
been stored. And another interesting thing is not only do you not only have statues in the Sardabs, which themselves become bigger and house more and bigger statues, you also tend to have statue niches and other rooms as well. And some of these statues are incorporated into the false door stela, so that instead of having the statue in the Sardab somewhere behind the stela, it's part of the false door complex. Um, here on the left, you have Meruhuka basically opening the doors and striding out to the offering area. You can see it with the little altar and the steps uh, right in front of it. Um, Idu decided to rise up out of the ground, possibly from his burial chamber, um, to take offerings in the lower part of his um, of his false door stila. And Iteti from Sakara um, is in a very similar way in the door area, like Meruruka. Meruruka, however, has a full standing striding statue. He has one foot forward, whereas Iteti decided to go the way of the rock cut tombs and show and have himself shown with both feet together. And we were talking about boats. Now, this is also something that is taken from the royal area aspect. Um, from the beginning, from the tombs of the first kings in Abydos, we know that there were boats buried near either the burial area or the offering area for the kings. The most spectacular find has been the, there are two of them, only one of them has been um, reconstructed so far, is the solar boats associated with the pyramid of Cheops. But boat pits have been found for almost all of the pyramids. Now these boats were actually only make sense for the royal concept of the afterlife in which the king ascends to the heavens and is in the solar boat. He's in the boat with the sun god. And he needs at least two because the sun god has two boats. He has one for going over the sky during the day and one for traversing the duat, the area of the world where also the afterlife is also located but which also includes a whole lot of other more or less dangerous areas. So the king would have two boats, like the solar barts of the sun god. Possibly the private people who decided to include boats in their funerary complex may have done so to have some a physical boat in which to go to Abydos. Um, this pilgrimage to Abydos was something that you hoped to do during your lifetime, and if you did, and you could afford it, you put up a stila somewhere along the processional way so you could take part in all the festivities. But if you couldn't, then you wanted to do it after you were dead. So you had depictions of boats going to Abydos throughout the history of the Old Kingdom. So it's possible that these boats were more for the pilgrimage to Abydos um, with a little wink to the royal boats and the solar con text, because anything that is solar, that is circular, is of course also associated with resurrection. What also appears in the Sixth Dynasty is that for the first time, the burial chambers are decorated as well. Not all of them, but some of them. And their decoration is extremely interesting. They include depictions uh, on the top right, you have a house with grain silos, and then you have various implements, you have jars that are full of things, you have um, food as well, you have various implements, and you have on the bottom right you can see an offering, uh, an offering list. The style of these depictions and the doors that are depicted that are not quite like the Foster Stila. They're very colorful and tend to imitate um, very colorful geometric matting. It's a very unique style that later on appears on the coffins of the Middle Kingdom. 
in the inside of the coffins. So you can see um, the top two rows on the right are from um, the burial chambers of Sakara, the priests Anti and Sabi, south of Sakara. Um, so these are the upper ones here. And you can see the similarities between the so-called frise d'objet that show various implements, jewelry, um, cosmetics, but also food and, and other implements that you want to take with you to the afterlife. Um, there's also these very elaborate doors that you can see um, here with the coffin of Gua from the British Museum. Um, you can see that door as well on the outside of our coffin of the priestess Henut. So this is basically a precursor of the Middle Kingdom coffins. Um, very rare, but also occasionally appearing is you have a mastaba with decorated rooms and then the subterranean rooms leading to the burial chamber are also decorated in the style of the rock cut tombs with the statues carved into the rock. Um, you can see this in the mastabas of Idu and Kar in Giza. Um, also with that pillage room just before a large series of, um, of carved statues. It's suggested that this had to do with the blatant instability of the political situation towards the end of the Old Kingdom, which may have got people thinking that their superstructures might be destroyed, and thus making sure that the essentials were also there in the substructure, which was more likely to survive, so that you're bringing things closer to the mummy and so that the equipment for eternity is right there and um, also less vulnerable to plundering or anything else that might happen. The stone being taken away to build something else, for example. Again, we have mastabas in the provinces as well. I was saying that um, we have one in Abydos that's interesting, and it is interesting because it does not have a southern burial, uh, a southern offering area. It has one in the middle of the wall with one false door, and it even has a little thing, some obelisks in front of it, it's, it's very chic. You can see reconstruction on the bottom left. Um, on the right, you can see where the offering stela was originally, um, and a, one sardab right, next, right behind it. And that may be because they already were in Abydos, they did not need a double, a northern and a southern offering area, but only one because they were already in Abydos and could take part in all the festivities. There are others that are found, um, for example, in Dendera, um, with a variety of different styles. This one has taken the long corridor style that has been out of fashion since the fourth dynasty, but there are others that are a bit more modern, have the staircases to the roof, um, have the courtyards, um, and the proliferation of rooms within the tumulus that we know from the Sixth Dynasty. And in the oasis, the governors there decided to go monumental and build these extremely large mastabas. And I chose this one because it's been excavated and you can see what a sloping passage would look like. Generally, the opening would have been outside the mastaba itself. You can see how it slopes downward to the burial chambers that you see on the bottom. And it would have been excavated basically as a trench and then covered as the superstructure was built. So the mastabas are the more iconic private tombs of the Old Kingdom, but let's not forget that there are also some rock cut tombs. And they appear towards the end of, well, starting we're heading towards the end of the fourth dynasty. The very earliest ones that we know are from the time of Kefren and belong to his queens. 
and they were built as a way to use more area of the Giza Plateau. So space was sort of becoming at a premium because once Cheops had filled up, you know, his big cemeteries, then Kefren built his pyramid, and then, you know, Mikorinos would then build his a bit further on, but there were no longer really these big wide open spaces. So they continued using the cemeteries of Cheops, adding to it and blurring the wonderful, you know, parallel streets that he had built. But they also used the old quarries that had been used to build the first pyramids and dug into them horizontally for rock cut tombs. The earliest have only two rooms generally, but they have pillars, which is not something you often see in the um, in the open chapels. And they have niches or statues, um, generally several at a time. It could be several of the same person, the tomb owner, just in case. Um, or it can show the tomb owner and various members of their families. And the false door stila are dug directly in to the bedrock again. Um, there are no sardabs because that would mean carving even more into the bedrock, somehow filling that up with rubble. So instead here, the statues are open. Apparently this was acceptable, which suggests that the sardabs were mostly as a means of protecting the freestanding statues. The burial chamber was accessed through vertical shafts usually, sometimes sloping passages um, that would lead from the cultic area. In the fifth dynasty, instead of two fairly square rooms, you tend to have these very long rooms, kind of reminiscent of what, again, what we had in the third dynasty and in the early fourth, these long rooms with um, offering areas along the wall. Um, here you can see on the right very well the, um, the false door stila. On the left you see one of the early ways of incorporating the statues into the false door stila that we also saw in Mastabas in the um, sixth dynasty. And you can see on the floor on the left these are vertical shafts. And on the right, it appears to be a sloping passage that would go down to the burial chamber. In the sixth dynasty, things get a little bit more elaborate. Um, the rooms tend to be more square again and grouped so that the longer part, they're still rectangular, but not quite as long, um, so that the longer part is parallel mm -hmm. to the cliff face. What also appears in the sixth dynasty is occasionally some built up area on a terrace in front of the entrance of the tomb. So a number of chapel rooms that would have preceded it in the sort of forecourt or in actual rooms. Um, instead of one long room, you do tend to have several at least, either all in the length behind each other or more squarely kind of arranged so that instead of one long room one longer room parallel to the cliff face, you would have several square rooms. Um, you have more and more important tombs, rock cut tombs in the provinces. They have always been sort of the default for the provinces. You have more rock cut tombs than you have built up tombs. Um, possibly because they had these wonderful cliff faces that were a bit closer to the Nile, um, a bit closer also to the villages that um, would have visited them. But towards the end of the sixth dynasty, they start getting bigger and bigger and bigger so that we are approaching the first intermediate period with the big rock cut tombs of the local governors who more or less took over the running of Egypt, not together, but each for his own little 
um, area or little government or known um, as the central power slowly crumbled. And we go into the first intermediate period called thus because there was no big central power. So with this, we have seen an overview of the tombs of the Old Kingdom, how the people who weren't pharaohs were interred. Of course, as in many aspects of Egyptian culture, it was mostly the rich people, but I think we were lucky enough to have a little insight in the poorer tombs as well. I hope you enjoy it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us, or if you're watching this on YouTube, to put it in the comments. Have a good day, and we hope to see you in our museum very soon.